How do you feel about that? How do you feel when the national media ignores you like that? It doesn't bother me that much because I understand it. I think it happens because they don't understand me. I believe politics is moved by a prevailing attitude. So if you're challenging economically and politically the prevailing attitude, and therefore somebody who wants to change it, you know, has uh, a long way to go. Mm -hmm. And I think it's either a misunderstanding or lack of understanding, uh, or they get locked in on ideas. You know, if I talk about monetary policy, and they say, it's not what we're taught, you know, mm -hmm. so they, they can't accept it. And, uh, and when I talk about a change in foreign policy, oh, we can't do that. We've been doing this for 50 years, and this would be disruptive to do that. So I understand that, although it can be a little bit aggravating that uh, as our numbers grow and support and fundraising, you'd think maybe it would be newsworthy. But uh, I also I place it uh, on an attitude, a prevailing attitude. But this is what's changing. All of a sudden now we're getting thousands if not millions of people talking about the Federal Reserve, talking about the federal, and you're talking about personal liberties, talking about the, uh, you, you know, the uh, TSA at airports mm -hmm. and our foreign policy. So the whole, the whole paradigm has shifted. So I feel pretty good actually what's happening. But uh, if, if people ask me, they, I, I have to admit that, uh, you know, there has been a slanted reporting of what I've been doing. Yeah. Well, pretty much everyone ag agrees that you have very provocative viewpoints and uh, but the knock on you has has been that despite your passionate supporters can you really do well in any type of general election do you have wider appeal what do you say to that mm -hmm. time will tell I, I i know what's i know the difference between what's happening in this country compared to when i ran on the same issues mm -hmm. in 1974 I know the difference between now and 1996. I know the difference between now and four years ago, now that we've been in war for 10 years and it's not going well, and uh, the financial bubble has burst. So the, it's a whole different world. So I would say, yes, these views are now becoming mainstream, and therefore, they're appropriate. Right. What is most driving you now as opposed to other elections that you've run in, in years prior? What's different this year? nothing because the driving force has always been personal liberty believing that if people have a right to their life and their liberty and they have a right to keep the fruits of their labor we would be free and po prosperous and the most the best chance ever to have peace so that drives me but uh, the the different uh, issues separated out from the general philosophy of freedom is you know the monetary policy, the Federal Reserve, the foreign policy, useless wars, doing things that are unconstitutional. You put this all together, and it's a lack of respect or desire or understanding about true liberty, and therefore they come together. But uh, the monetary issue was one of the particular issues that has driven me uh, over the many years. We talked about this briefly before the camera went on, but what did you think of John Stewart's comments that you were the 13th floor of American politics, that nobody really likes to talk about you, and the only time the media ever talks about you is to remind themselves that they don't need to talk about you? Well, I thought it was rather astounding as far as uh, quality of reporting goes. <laughs> he was fantastic. <laughs> I mean, to put all that together, I mean, if, uh, if a person could be convinced uh, mm -hmm. uh, by that, then they'll never be convinced. I saw another poll, which I have no idea who did it, but they said, do you think Ron Paul got, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, shorted, you know, on his coverage after coming in doing pretty well at, right. at Ames? And I think it was 98 percent <laughs> said that uh, they shorted me on my on the coverage. So, mm -hmm. uh, but I. Uh, it probably was a result of John Stewart right. that convinced so many people. How frustrating was it for you, though, to do so well at Ames and then to essentially be ignored uh, for the most part until John Stewart made his comments? That was it frustrating to you? Was it upsetting? What, what uh, was your reaction? Uh, I don't use the word frustrating, and I don't even use the word upsetting. I just acknowledge it and see all the positive things that have happened because I didn't. I didn't think we'd be this far along in converting the country to the views I've expressed because I am challenging. I want to change a lot. Mm -hmm. I'm challenging 100 years of history. Mm -hmm. So frustration isn't the right word, uh, but it would be that, uh, you know, we have to keep working harder. But fortunately today, 
we, we don't have to depend on the five major interviews on Sunday morning because the fact that I was excluded became the event and uh, it was tremendous on our fundraising and the internet fills up the gaps. So we live in a different world and uh, it's not so much that we're so great at using alternative sources, but the country and the people who are interested in spreading ideas, they're worldwide. You know, somebody I think had a report today that they were asking these, you know, to re uh, respond about the fairness of the uh, uh, of the coverage, and I think they had responses from 26 different countries. So it's it's a world event. It's a different world, and it's all beneficial to what I've been trying to do. Okay, if we can switch gears a little bit now to a couple of issues that are popping up in, in the campaign. Number one, your position on the debt ceiling, and you know what. What do you think, and you've been quoted on this extensively, but what do you think the U.S. did wrong here? On raising, on on the raising the debt, that's the thing. You, you don't think it should have been Well, right. it just perpetuates the problem. I mean, the problem is debt. How do, you, how do you solve the problem of debt by going further in debt? An individual couldn't do it. If they can for a while, they just get a new credit card and go to the bank and say, loan me more money. But eventually, it has to get turned off. And it, and it happens to a country, too. But to solve the problem of debt, by just raising the debt limit and spending more money and printing more money. It's absolutely bizarre. It makes our problems worse. What did you think about the S&P downgrade? No, I think they were too little too late. I mean, I don't think... Do you think, think it was called for? Well, I don't think they're relevant. The market is the best, the, the, the best indicator, and the market has been saying there's something seriously wrong because the best interpretation of a country's wealth and uh, productivity and, and future expectation is the value of their currency. And the only true measurement of a currency for thousands of years has been the relationship to gold. And uh, when I started in this business in the 70s, when I became worried about what we were embarking on, gold was $35 an ounce. And now it's a little bit higher than that. <laughs> so, so that's a, no, a vote of no confidence. S&P S&P, what credibility do they have? Did they warn us about Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac? Uh, so, so they're not all that relevant. Now, what, what happened after they raided us? The SEC put pressure on them, and the guy gets fired, you know, for even suggesting that. That's how, how bizarre the whole thing is. But, so market indicators are much more powerful than a few individuals running these rating agencies, so I don't place a lot of stock in this. If elected, what would you do away with? in the federal government? A bunch. Uh, what would I keep? <laughs> uh, no, it's most of the departments uh, really either be radically downsized or get rid of. But uh, the most important thing um, would be to change the amount of money we spend on militarism. Uh, and that would be the change in foreign policy, which a president can do. He can bring the troops home. He's in charge of the troops. That would save a lot of money. And that's where I would start. I wouldn't start on cutting health care, you know, especially for the poor and the elderly. Uh, hopefully we could work our way out and wean people off. But right now, the optimism isn't all that great. But how realistic is that? If you were elected, you'd pull troops out of everywhere right away. As quickly as possible. And, and, what, and this would send a powerful signal to the markets. He's serious. And then you put that in with it, not increasing the regulations and suspending the regulations that you can. This would be a powerful signal to the markets. This would say maybe business people might want to invest again. He's not going to shove down our throats the regulations of Obamacare and all these other regulations which people are skittish about. It would strengthen the dollar. You need a strong dollar. You want to invite capital back in. So just the fact that they would see that within days the troops were on their way home. We did this after World War II. We brought millions of people home and slashed the military budget, and we had economic growth again. Would you get rid of the income tax? Sure. How? Well, you have to get rid of the... You can't get rid of the income tax unless you get rid of all the spending. But people think it's bizarre, but did we have one before 1913? No, we didn't have an income tax. It just encourages the bureaucrats and the politicians to spend more money. So, no, you have to change the attitude about the role of government. If you want the entitlement system and if you want the, uh, to be the policeman of the world, you have to have an income tax and a lot more, and you, then you don't have enough taxes. Then you have to borrow and you have to create a financial bubble, and you have to suffer the consequences, which is the consequences of what we're facing today, which is a disaster. So having a different attitude about the role of government is the only thing that's important and that's how you get rid of the income tax.
Libya, what most concerns you about the situation right now? I want to know within the next six months or a year who owns the oil. It's all about oil. I mean, it started in uh, the uh, uh, eastern part of Libya. Uh, the uh, interests are manyfold. They're international. Uh, na uh, uh, NATO was in there, and the United Nations was in. I, I hope this is a victory for the people. I'm not very optimistic. I think it's a victory for empire, and it is destructive toward our republic because our government went to war, subsidized this, and just flaunted themselves and said, we don't have to even tell the people. We don't even have to explain to the Congress. We don't have to get permission to do it. So that's an attack on, on republic, the republic. But it, it emphasized, you know, the, the idea of empire. So wait and see in a year how much chaos we have there and who's benefiting from the oil. But are you happy to see Gaddafi out? Sure. I mean... Uh, but you it, don't think that the way it was done was correct? Well, I don't think that our CIA should have orchestrated it and, and buy into it and set the, set the conditions ripe for the Al-Qaeda. See, we never had no Al-Qaeda was in Iraq before the war. Now there is. There'll be Al-Qaeda. As bad as these dictators are, they usually have some type of, uh, mm -hmm. uh, maintain some type of order because they don't allow al-Qaeda and other radicals to come in. They want to be the, the radical dictator. So I think that uh, I think things won't go well here in the next year or two. They will not go well. I don't think so. I hope so that it does, uh, mainly because uh, in, in uh, Egypt, uh, we're just changing one military guy for another military guy. What most worries you in foreign policy at this instance? perpetual war that, that contributes to perpetual debt and destroys our economy and that's the way all republics go and I believe we're on the verge of this so if the people don't wake up and decide that enough is enough we don't need to be spending a trillion and a half dollars a year in our operations nearly 900 bases 150 countries around the world it can't be maintained it's a drain on us so that concerns me because it contributes significantly to the destruction of our republic and our personal liberties when you're at war it's much easier to undermine personal liberties the attitude of the patriot act to take care of us and the tsa agents that's all uh, done because people get frightened and scared that they're about to attack us. So that, that is uh, my biggest fear. If you are not elected, who would you support? Depends on who's running. Depends on who's running. Have you ever actually met Rick Perry? I have not. You have not? I have not met him. To so my memory. I mean, it's always possible you, you could have shaken hands. But I do not recall having ever met him or talk, had a conversation with him. You've never had a conversation. Some people will find that surprising that you've been a congressman in Texas for you know, so long, and he's been the longest serving governor in Texas history, and both of you really have never had a conversation? That's correct. Why do you think that is? I have no idea. I mean, I didn't extend myself to ask for an invitation to come to the governor's mansion. Uh, but it is true that uh, over the years, although I had my disagreements with uh, both President Bush Sr. and Jr., uh, I, I met both of them. And most of the time, uh, no, all the time, the uh, conversations were very cordial. But uh, they knew and I knew that we didn't see eye to eye on foreign policy and a few other things. But, but it was never estranged you know we 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 talked to each other do you